It's a pleasure to be here. Let me uh, begin by thanking CSIS for the leadership that it has shown on so many different uh, issues that affect American foreign policy and, and for convening uh, this conference today. And also uh, would like to state the obvious, and that is that there are a lot of people who are going to be on the panels uh, and in the discussions that follow my own that have uh, spent a good part of their lives working on American foreign policy and specifically on this issue as well and commenting on American foreign policy uh, from the other side. So there's a lot of expertise in the room. I uh, want to uh, recognize and express my appreciation for, for all of that and I'd like to give one uh, personal shout out to David Steinberg. Uh, Professor, okay, now you've been marked, David, for when your uh, Q&As begin after your panel, but uh, he has been working on uh, the issue of American-Burma relations for probably since 1962, as I recall, um, 58, okay, 1958, so um, I think he's, he brings a wealth of, uh, of experience and observation to this, and I know it's uh, probably uh, just as rewarding a feeling for, for him and others to see how far we have been able to come in the last couple of years as it has been for, for me. This has been an interesting uh, week in terms of uh, the evolution in the political environment and uh, in, I'm going to say Burma, I, um, I'm still a member of the United States government until January. Um, but it's been a remarkable week. Uh, I was one of a dozen senators that were a part of the greeting party for Dao Aung San Suu Kyi last week, and then the morning before she received the Congressional Gold Medal. It was uh, quite interesting in that meeting to, to hear her views and the wisdom that she brings to the resolution of this issue. This week we also represent uh, uh, welcome uh, President Thein Sein, which is a big moment also for the, uh, the evolution of these relations. And I've often said over the past year that the greatest um, reason I think that we were able to see the changes that have taken place has been because of the courage of these two people uh, and the courage of both of them to work together, Dao Aung San Suu Kyi and President Thein Sein are completely different people in terms of their personal backgrounds and in terms of their professional experience. Uh, Dao Aung San Suu Kyi is a member of a revered family, as all of us know. Her uh, father uh, was killed when she was two years old, uh, leading the independence movement for Burma right after World War II. President Thein Sein, if you look at an article that was published in the, in the New York Times last summer, uh, came from a village in a remote area which still to this day does not have paved roads. She had one journey, studied in the West, uh, has a tremendous understanding of the way that we talk about democracy. He had another journey through the military. Uh, but at a critical time uh, in the evolution of the, the political uh, mentality in the country, they came together and they decided to work together and they're still working together. And I think some of the most impressive comments that Aung San Suu Kyi made last week were that it is important to incentivize and, and to reward positive conduct uh, and to work together to build a new type of a political system. And this was the message that I attempted to take to Burma when I went in 2009 as well. I would like to begin in terms of my own uh, perspective on this issue uh, with the views that I brought to the United States Senate about the United States relations with Asia writ large. Uh, it was one of my principal goals when coming to the Senate to do what I could to reinvigorate the relationships between our country and East and Southeast Asia. We had, for two different reasons, I think, lost 
the intensity that we, tr we traditionally have brought into those relationships, the intensity in a good sense of the word. One was the emotional and financial uh, and time drain that had been taken up by the war in Iraq and Afghanistan. Our, our attention span, our energies as a country had been focused on that part of the world, I think to the detriment of our relations in East Asia. The second was when we spoke of East Asia, so often, particularly in the, in the political environments where your time is limited, we were speaking more and more about United States-China relations, their vital relations, their very complicated relations, uh, two completely different governmental systems that are intertwined economically and are sorting out uh, security relations. But we weren't focusing enough on the uh, other countries in the region, some would call them the second tier countries, but the other countries in the regions with which our relations are equally important. The role of the United States for a long time has been as an Asian nation. That's one thing I think people tend to forget. In fact, our first uh, treaty of uh, friendship and cooperation was with Thailand. Uh, I think 1832, but it was the presidency of Andrew Jackson. Um, and since World War II, the United States has proved to be the balancing factor, the stabilizing force uh, in East Asia, and particularly in Northeast Asia, at some cost, when you look at the Korean War and the Vietnam War. Uh, but the United States has been in our view, in my view, the honest broker in terms of ass assisting this region in maintaining the kind of stability that allows economic systems to grow and, and political uh, systems to mature. So when I came to the Senate, I decided that from our office, uh, with the uh, time that we had available as a member of the Foreign Relations Committee and eventually as the chair of the East Asia and Pacific Subcommittee, that we would focus on energizing our relations with Japan, with Korea, and with ASEAN. And particularly among ASEAN, the countries of Vietnam, Thailand, Singapore, and to work to rechange, to re rebalance the formula in Burma. Those six countries have taken up an enormous amount of time uh, from the perspective of our office since I've been in the Senate. We have traveled to all of those countries. We have worked with uh, people at the minister level and at the national leadership level. We have hosted meetings in our, in our office uh, to discuss uh, the complexities of many of these relationships and the future of the United States uh, in those countries and in the, the region. I've spent a great deal of time in Vietnam in my life my wife is here today. I'm really proud to have her here. She was born in Vietnam. She uh, uh, came here as a refugee, eventually graduated from Cornell Law School. She's the smart one in this couple. Um, I've been, I first returned to Vietnam in 1991. I uh, have been in Vietnam, I think, every year but three since 1991, um, working with the Vietnamese community here, working with the Vietnamese government over there to attempt to move our two countries past the war into the future. I brought American companies into Vietnam for two and a half years at one point. I spent a great deal of time in China, excuse me, in Japan, um, first as a Marine, um, then as a journalist, um, and as a writer, uh, other than a journalist, as a novelist. I was the first American journalist allowed inside the Japanese prison system in the 1980s, writing a piece on uh, uh, Americans in Japanese jails. Um, I've had many visits to Okinawa. I worked as a military planner uh, on Guam in 1974. The issues now that we have been facing with Okinawa uh, and Guam were issues that I began working on in the, in the 1970s. As a senator, I was the first member of Congress to visit Laos in I think seven years. I was the first member of Congress to visit Cambodia in two years. Um, and at the end of 
2008, I decided that the time had come for us to reach out to the military government in Burma and see if we could not uh, have the kind of discussion that could, on the one hand, clearly lay out American uh, objectives, but on the other, try to incentivize conduct and see if we couldn't start working on a different way forward in, in that country. I uh, first went to Burma in 2001 as a private citizen. I had written a piece for the Wall Street Journal about, uh, it was actually it was called the, 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 uh, the Struggle for the Mastery of Asia. I didn't title that, the Wall Street Journal did, but it was about American interests in Asia the emerging influence of uh, China in the region and the concern that the United States was not addressing these second tier countries uh, to the detriment of the stability of the region and also of, of our country. And there was an individual who uh, had a business in Burma. He had, uh, I think it was Chris Kingsley. I'm gonna give him a plug here. He probably had the finest outdoor uh, furniture business in the world. And he sent me a letter he said, if you want to see a place where uh, American inattention and uh, the Chinese involvement is causing uh, potential problems down the road, come and visit me. So I was on my way to Vietnam and Thailand, and I uh, was in a neighborhood. So I went over, and I spent eight days with him. He had a, a, a very successful business. He was uh, uh, hiring Burmese citizens, not only to work, but also in the management structure. Uh, I was able to walk around freely, see things uh, on the countryside, see the country, um, but also stuck in my mind, having worked on the issues in Vietnam years before, he kept telling me, you know, we've got a good thing going here. We, 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 we are teaching people business models. They're, uh, you know, we're, we're getting economic growth, and guess what? I'm going to be out of here. This was 01. He said, I'm going, to, I'm going to be out of here by 03. He said, our sanctions are coming down. I'm not going to be able to do business here. Um, and he was correct. He's still a very successful businessman in Asia, but he eventually had to shut his business down. Um, that had stayed in my mind, um, and I had been in uh, communication with him and others uh, since then. So we decided... Um, at the end of 08, that we would try to put together uh, a visit to the heads of state in Burma. It took us seven months of very careful preparation in order to make this visit. Uh, I made it in the context of a larger visit to five Southeast Asian mainland countries, uh, Vietnam, Thailand, Laos, Cambodia, and, and, then, uh, and then Burma. Um, I became the first American leader in 10 years uh, to have visited that country. I was the only, I think I will remain the only American leader ever to have met with Tan Shui, uh, the leader of the military government. Um, I also, at my request, was able to uh, meet with Aung San Suu Kyi, who then was under house arrest. Um, and from that visit, I think a, a couple of results occurred. The first was that it was clear to me uh, that this, the government and the people had become so remote uh, over the past 20 or the preceding 20 years that they didn't know how to approach uh, the West properly, um, even those that were, were very desirous of doing so. The ruling uh, committee had actually shrunk uh, over the years. It had not added new bodies. It was, uh, the, the language skills were poor. The understanding on the street was poor. And in fact, one of the points that uh, Aung San Suu Kyi made last week uh, when we were meeting with her was that uh, if you truly are going to grow democracy, uh, the people on the street, the people in the small uh, governing bodies have to come to understand the principles just as well as the people who are coming over here to have the meetings, which uh, was one of the reasons that I personally 
uh, supported the idea of lifting the sanctions in Vietnam uh, so many years ago. The presence of people uh, from different uh, uh, governmental systems and different cultures on the street in a country that's been so remote has, has an incredible impact, um, sort of a hydraulic impact, for lack of a better word, that goes out uh, in, into the communities. Um, and I came away with a belief that in order to change uh, the conduct of political systems, it was vital to encourage and to incentivize, and not simply to criticize, that there comes a point where you must retain your national principles, but at the same time, you must show that there is uh, an upside uh, to, the, uh, to the leadership uh, and to the, uh, the average member of any governing, governing system to, to make these sorts of changes. Um, when you think about the notion of sanctions and removing sanctions, um, it also stuck in my mind that we lifted sanctions on China 41 years ago. And the Chinese governmental system is clearly not a dem democratic governmental system. But in that part of the world, you have, to, you have to take change as it comes. You have to take what you can and build on it. We lifted sanctions um, on Vietnam 18 years ago. And so after that meeting and a series of meetings here over the years, um, and a return visit this, this year in April following the successful uh, elections, I think we can say that the governing systems in Burma uh, have made a uh, pretty, or taken a pretty dramatic risk. People like Tan Sein have taken a pretty dramatic, dramatic risk, something that we don't often see, particularly in that part of the world, and that is that they have agreed to change their political system before they change their economic system. Um, generally, the, the formula that we were using, the premise that we were using when we looked at countries like China and Vietnam was obviously the reverse, that if you change the economic system, if the well-being of people increases, then there will be, um, so the theory goes, then there will be loosening of the political system. But they have done this the other way around in, uh, in Burma. And I believe strongly that when the moment comes, in a lot of different situations in history, you need to take it, you need to seize it, and you need to build on it. And I think that's what we are seeing right now. I think it is strongly in the national interest of the United States uh, to encourage and to support these changes. I think we've heard very positive and wise comments from Aung San Suu Kyi um, last week. Uh, we will continue to hear from her. I think that the State Department uh, in this administration has given the right signals to, to President Thanh Sein as he has come to this country with the type of uh, official welcome that he is receiving. And I'm hopeful that we can continue to build on this. Where is this going to go? Politically and economically, it really depends on uh, whether we work to continue to increase openness in this society. What I don't want to see is to have this situation fall into the old definitions that we've used in places like uh, Vietnam and, and, uh, and, and China to a certain extent, where you have the communist and the anti-communist, or the, the, uh, you know, the uh, forces of repression versus the forces of liberation. We are at a threshold here where I am seeing, and Aung San Suu Kyi mentioned this last week, I'm seeing the uh, intentions of the people who have been on the governing side and the military side uh, to want to learn democracy. They come over here and they say, w teach us how, show us how to do this. Not all of them are that way. I'm not, uh, you know, I'm a, I'm a realist here, but 
what we need to do is work with both parties, with all parties, uh, to emphasize uh, the tenets of democracy, to, to work to, to put that into the system so this isn't simply um, anti-democracy versus pro-democracy. What we want to see, and I think we have the potential right now, is democratic principles being implanted into the system uh, so that you can have a vigorous uh, political growth that will also, with it, have a vigorous uh, economic growth. The big, there are two big holdbacks, holdups in terms of uh, the potential for economic growth in this country. The first, obviously, is infrastructure. Uh, this, is, this is a country that has been very remote, uh, that's going to need a lot of infrastructure, physical infrastructure. And the second is the willingness of uh, countries like our own to, to, at a minimum, suspend the sanctions, to test the concept, um, to allow investment, and to, uh, to see if uh, this can't be a situation where um, the growth of the country and the success in the future can match the potential that so many people were seeing back in 1958 when uh, Dr. Steinberg was uh, first visiting uh, the country. So that is my, uh, my message to you today, and I'm happy to be able to join uh, you at a time that, as Dr. Hamry said, uh, a lot of people thought wouldn't, wouldn't be occurring. With that, I'll take a few of your questions. Thank you, Senator Webb. Uh, I'd like to uh, open the floor for questions. Uh, usual CSIS rules, this is on the record. Um, please uh, just state your name and your organization. And, and please, uh, we'd appreciate uh, questions and, and not any filibustering. This is not the, this, despite the fact that we have a senator here, this is not the, not the Senate. I've been filibustered for six years. <laughs> this would be. <laughs> so let's open the floor for questions, please. Thank you, Senator Webb. Thank you, Ernie Bauer and the CSIS. My name is Jimmy Nguyen. I'm with Voice of Vietnamese Americans. I'd like to congr congratulate all the Myanmar scholars here, especially Dr. Meng Meng Tan. I met him four years ago. He was working very hard on this, and today is, um, he was very happy. I congratulate him. I also thank my friend from METI, Mr. Doshi Okia helping this. I, um, I want to ask Senator Webb one significant point that you brought up, that Myanmar has come quickly to a new page of history because they have decided to change the political governing system first before economic changes. And we've seen that both sides, President Hun Sen and our democratic leader, Aung San Suu Kyi, have been able to work together because, because they have decided to work on one governing system changing. Would you say that has been the main obstacle that we need to overcome in bringing the democratic um, system to around the world? I'm saying that you were saying that we need to not sanctioning the suppressions for Right, could you government. just uh, state your last sentence, uh, the question again? The, the point you brought up is the happy ending came because they changed the political system first. They decided to change the political system first before economic changing. So would you say that for many other systems who we have already reached the economic changes significantly, is well, that I, a point I, that I we see can what you're somehow yeah. The each one of these, each one of these countries has their own histories, uh, their own, their own histories of conflict, external conflict and internal conflict. As you know, I've worked very hard on the uh, on the Vietnamese issue for many many years. Um, I would be, I, I want to be very careful in terms of how we are categorizing what has happened in Burma. Um, 
this wasn't a sudden happy ending, and we're hopefully we can continue the progress that has made. Um, the first step that was made in uh, 10, 2010, following my visit, was a was an indication that they would actually they had they had announced this before my visit, but was um, this movement toward uh, elections, and this was carefully. Uh, designed by the military regime so that the, the military would, would retain uh, overall authority even though they were testing the concept of elections. Um, there were a lot of people who uh, were critical of that decision. In fact, when I came out in 2009, um, you'll recall I, uh, I had the dubious honor of uh, bringing out an American uh, who had uh, attempted to save Aung San Suu Kyi by swimming in the in the lake, and uh, you know nobody knew what to what to do with him. Um, when I it was one of the three things when I met Tan Shui, one of the the, th the 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 three things that I asked him. The third one was, you know, why don't I just take this person off your hands? I mean, he's clearly ill. Uh, so of course, when I came out from this visit and I got to to Bangkok, there were like. 200 press cameras there. They all wanted to see this this fellow, and we got him where he needed to be, which it was under medical care. But then I had all these cameras there, so they were. Uh, <laughs> the, the very first question that I received, and this this relates to your point, the the very first question that I received um, was, "How can you go in and support this dubious concept of elections when it is so clear?" that the military is going to gain, is going to keep control through this process. And my answer was, when is the last time China's had an election of any sort? Uh, you have to start somewhere. Uh, and, I, and I think that this is what has happened in Burma. And, and I, I, you know, as, my, as my grandma used to say, I, I, I think we're sort of over the fence and halfway through the pasture here. I mean, I think that, that it's been tested now twice so that we really are at a place where you can open up and, and hope for a transition in, into full democracy. But it wasn't like a light switch. Um, and the same goes for, for these other, other countries. The, what, what we were able to do in this particular situation is to lay out um, a, a series of confidence builders from their perspective, from our, our perspective, and I, I think actually my initial visit served as a something of a confidence builder that we would come and talk to them and then I could actually explain my views of, of how this process might work. Um, the same is true in terms of hoping for uh, more open governmental systems in, in, in other countries in the region. Um, we hope we can in, in, you know, incentivize a certain type of conduct, make it into the uh, uh, the uh, um, sort of make it something that these governmental systems believe is to, is to their benefit as well. What, we, what we've had in Burma, I think, is a win-win-win. So far. So far. Well, that's why I'm, I'm trying to say cautiously that we, we, we need to stay on this just to, to get people out and to get our people in and to have this become an evolutionary process. Yes, sir. Thank you. Uh, Alessandro Pierre from the Asian Development Bank office in Washington. Uh, there is a number of ethnic nationalities in Burma. How do you see their role in the continuation of the political and economic development process? How do you see them getting integrated in that? Well, first, I, I think that the, uh, the situation with the ethnic, the different ethnic uh, nationalities, as, as you term them, uh, is one of has been one of the unspoken difficulties uh, in 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 terms of normalization of the political process inside Burma as a whole. Um, people like uh, Mint Tan, uh, uh, who's uh, someone I listen to a lot, is the grandson of Utant, uh, um, the former uh, United Nations head, has written uh, very adroitly on these issues. Um, 
Um, I see that this particular government uh, right now has put the, uh, the resolution of these issues on the front burner. They've put their good leaders on it. Um, we, we read every day about um, uh, you know, resolutions, uh, a resolution of the issues. When I was in Burma in April, I went up uh, to uh, uh, a place where they were negotiating with one of the groups and, and observed some of the negotiations. So the number one step is to, to demonstrate that there can be uh, something of a harmonious political relationship among all the different parties. And uh, there are uh, economic incentives that have been built, being built into those negotiations. Senator, uh, I wonder if I could uh, just ask a question for, uh, before you go back to the floor. Could you give us a sense of the, the interest and the level of support you got in the Senate for the engagement you're, you're seeking in Myanmar in particular and Southeast Asia in general? A lot of us are concerned with folks like uh, uh, Senator Lieberman and Senator Luger leaving, uh, and you leaving uh, in January, that the, the depth of, of focus and, and um, sort of granular uh, understanding of, of Asia is, is starting to weaken in the Senate. What would you say about that? I, I would say that you have a legitimate concern. I think one of the, uh, the difficulties in um, the United States Congress in general is the attention span that people are able to apply to um, a number of these different issues, which is actually one of the reasons that I began this discussion by laying out our objectives uh, in terms of uh, invigorating the relations uh, with countries that don't make it to the, to the discussion. It's very, very true. And in terms of this particular issue, um, I, th I think as Dr. Hamry pointed out at the beginning, we become set in our, in our views um, and w the, the way that the Senate votes reinforces a certain position to the point that it becomes an assumption and it's very difficult to break past the assumption that may have had some sort of applicability 10 years ago, uh, but needs, needs to be adjusted. And uh, uh, I'm very proud of the fact that on our staff, and actually I have David Bonine here as my, my uh, legislative director, and Marta McClellan Ross, who's worked on our Foreign Relations Committee, both of them uh, longtime uh, Asia hands, that uh, we were able just through the uh, exertion of the energies on our staff to break through a lot of that. Uh, and, and actually it applies also to issues like the... Uh, uh, the need for the adjustment on the military bases in Okinawa, that's a huge, huge issue in terms of Japanese uh, domestic politics and our strategic positioning in, in that part of the world. I started working on that issue in 1974 when I was in law school. I worked as a military planner on Guam and wrote a facilities analysis um, of all of our bases in the Pacific showing how we could readjust this positioning between Okinawa and Guam. Um, and I came back from one of my trips to, to Japan uh, a few years ago. I, I went up to Chairman Levin and I said, this, you know, this is probably among the top two or three domestic political issues in Japan. It's been dragging out for 16 years. Where is the United States... Uh, where should the United States be? How should this relationship work? Um, and finally, after a year, Chairman Levin, who I greatly admire, uh, he's a great chairman, uh, came up to me and he said, we need to go out there. But that's rare. You just said, we need, well, I want to go see it. So he uh, went out with me. And we went to Guam, went to Tinian, went up to, uh, to Okinawa, went up and talked to Tokyo. And it's just rare that you can get that kind of attention on these issues. And they are so vital to the future of our relationship in that part of the world and the future stability of uh, the region. We have time for one more question. Uh, the young lady here. Um, my name is Lynn Kwok. I'm a fellow at the Harvard Kennedy School. Um, Senator Webb, you mentioned incentivizing um, the interested parties in Myanmar to make sure that they want democracy for the country. Could you elaborate a little bit on um, what you mean by 
uh, what, what this um, incentivization might entail. In particular, how much does it mean um, ensuring that the country sees certain economic benefits? Or um, does it mean um, ensuring that certain parties, individuals or groups, have um, their economic interests maintained in the country? Thank you. I'm sorry, could you say the last part of it, or, or does it mean individuals? Yeah, um, well, does it, does incentivizing interested parties in Myanmar entail making sure that the country as a whole benefits, or that certain individuals or groups within the country are able to see their vested interests or their wealth maintained? Right. Um, I think the, I would begin with the, uh, the comment that I made during my opening remarks about how remote the country itself had become in, in every sense of the word, and it was clear to me in 01 when I was visiting it, um, the, the lack of interaction uh, was hurting the potential for the country to develop in every sense of the word, economically, politically, culturally. If you remember when I was young and in school, and I think Dr. Steinberg would comment about this also, people were thinking that Burma was going to be the, the great success story of Southeast Asia. Um, so on the one hand, the conversations that I was having with, with people would, would, would be, were to examine the potential and the vulnerability of dealing only with these closed regimes. Uh, economically and, and strategically, that a relationship with the United, United States, open relationship with the United States would be to the benefit of the economic systems and the, and, and the security. And then secondly, and, and again this is something Aung San Suu Kyi made a very good uh, point on last week, is you cannot simply condemn. You can't simply say this, you, are, you are all evil. You know, you have to say, we must change. And for those who want change, you need to, to bring them into the system and work with them. Uh, I, I watched uh, last week during some of these meetings when uh, some people who've been very um, properly loyal to the democratic movement in, inside Burma would, would ask her about, you know, sort of the, how are, you, how are these people treating you now? What, you know, is this, going, you know, et cetera, et cetera. And in every single case, she was saying, I may not like some of the things that happened to me, but we have to work with people. We have to change attitudes. We have to, we have to move forward. Um, and so that is incentivizing, in my view, um, the people who, many of whom were a part of the old regime to show them that this is a better way um, and that uh, we're not going to come in and, um, you know, go, go do what we did in Iraq and throw every single person who ever had anything to do with the regime out uh, of, of uh, government. Uh, at the same time, uh, we've been very clear that people who uh, were what our the administration calls the bad actors are not going to be a part of our relations. They're not going to be allowed to, to come to this country. Um, but thus is individual. It's not, it's not the whole system. It's not everyone who was uh, involved in it, and it shouldn't be. Yeah. Uh, Senator Jim Webb, thank you very much for okay. joining thank us. Thank you very much. Be with you.